Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to part three of our 2020 Google Summer of Code final showcases. This year we had 20 interns between the Mesos Initiative and Apache Interact, so we split out our showcase demonstrations across four sessions. Today is the third one. On day one, we had four show or five showcases. We had both Quran and Muscon demonstrate the enhancements they've done in rewriting our web app, which will hopefully soon be released in the next one to two months. Uh, Abhijit also worked on a UI project, writing out and building a new user interface for digital banks on top of FinteractCN. And then Chin May showcased his efforts in building out SDK for our Android apps on Finteract one .x. And lastly, Ivanch worked on the fifth version of our mobile wallet. And then in round two of our showcases, Yash demonstrated the computer vision PPI application. Garvit his work on our mobile banking app for Finterac CN. Likewise, Shivangi the work on the mobile app for Finterac 1.x. And then Monthan walked us through the extensive code refactoring and Swagger APIs he worked on. And this year walked us through what he'd done around migrating the ORM from OpenGPA to Eclipse Fund. And then Anker closed with demonstrating the open making FinTech app he'd been working on. And for today's showcases, we're going to have Shashank uh, demonstrate the latest version of our Android client for Finrac 1.x. And then Manish is going to showcase the online banking app in its latest iteration. Ashwin has been working on converting our customer facing applications to the Kotlin framework to leverage multi platform capabilities. And then Shubham is going to demonstrate the GSMA mobile money API connector. He's built on top of the payment hub. And then Mehul is going to showcase the credit scorecards for machine learning that he's worked on. And then this Thursday will be our final day of showcases. And we'll have the demonstration of the new configuration wizard on top of the web app UI, along with additional screens for the operations UI and the payment hub. We're going to have a demonstration of the many changes that Ahmed has worked on on the Android field operations app for FinRxCN. And then Percy will walk us through the code quality and testing coverage improvements he worked on. And then Rahul is going to demonstrate the integration with credit bureaus focused on Myanmar at the moment. So with all that being said, once again, thank you to all of our interns for their great contributions this summer. We're looking forward to working with them throughout the rest of the year and long into the future as the maintainers and leaders of our community. So just one moment, I'm going to make additional attendees panelists, and then we'll get started with our showcases. And so I think I was going to have you kick off Shashank. So if you want to begin sharing your screen, you'll be our first presenter, and I think you should have the ability to do that. Oh, and I think your, your audio might be on mute at the moment, or you might not have audio connected yet, Shashank. So, Manish, we might have you start with your showcase first. So, if you're ready to present, we'll let you go first. And while Manish is getting his screen yeah. share ready, yeah, he worked on the latest version of our online banking app under the mentorship of Ankit. So take it away when you're ready, Manish. So. Okay. See my screen? Uh, just one moment. Oh, okay, I think. Yeah. Uh, I think you need to stop your sharing. No, yours is visible now. Okay, go right ahead, Manish. Hello. 
Okay, so hi everyone. I am Manish, and I am a uh, final year st uh, student, and I'm pursuing my bachelor's of uh, computer science engineering. So uh, this year, I was working on uh, online banking app uh, version four. So uh, the project mainly involved writing a revamp revamp version of the web self service app on top of the uh, latest Angular framework, Angular nine. So, uh, yeah, I, I would like to uh, give a brief walkthrough along with the guest. And uh, so, so the first part was uh, to bring up the project from scratch. Uh, for that, uh, we needed to decide a proper project structure and, uh, and so that it's scalable and, uh, and it's uh, uh, like it follows the basic clean code principles as well. So, uh, uh, with after discussion with my mentors, uh, we got to arrive uh, that uh, we should use the same project structure that is used in the web app, which is which is going to be probably uh, a, a release uh, in the coming months. So, uh, web app has uh, has a pretty good uh, like uh, the whole design according to the Angular framework. So. Uh, I followed the same structure and then I uh, set up the project and uh, then I built the, uh, all the UI components uh, again uh, with the help of Angular Material 9 and uh, then uh, uh, we followed on integrating the self-service APIs uh, to uh, achieve the functionalities. So uh, for the code, uh, the, uh, the repository uh, name is online banking since there are uh, two to three repositories uh, with uh, almost same names so this is the repository on which i was working on this uh, summer of course uh, online banking and uh, the project has also been deployed to uh, github pages at uh, so So yeah, this is the home screen uh, for the online banking app. Uh, the UI has been prepared uh, more like a replica of the previous web self-service app. And uh, so after login, the user is directed to a dashboard screen. Uh, where uh, he can see a summary of uh, total accounts and he can see the total loan amount and total account balance and also the charts uh, according to the status of his uh, status, of, status of their accounts uh, so moving on uh, this was so uh, this was the first uh, deliverable uh, setting of the project architecture uh, the second deliverable was uh, the login UI and API integration and the third deliverable was dashboard UI and its API integration. Uh, after that, I then created the accounts component and integrated it with the self-service APIs. Uh, so here is the accounts component. So this, uh, this has been prepared with the help of uh, Angular material table and uh, uh, sort, pagination, everything is working fine. Uh, even the filter is working fine. Uh, for example, uh, you can see. Uh, so currently uh, we support only three types of accounts, saving, savings accounts, loan accounts, and share accounts. And uh, then uh, the next deliverable uh, was uh, recent transactions uh, UI and API integration. So uh, accounts uh, component, recent transaction components, uh, all are making use of the same Angular material table. So their look and uh, functionality is almost same. Uh, uh, just the columns and the API calls differ. And uh, 
then the next was uh, then the next component on which i worked was writing the charges component and integrating it to api so uh, this uh, this is the ch uh, charge component so and uh, the next yeah so the uh, the next component on which i worked was uh, transfers component so um, the transfers component uh, i for the transfers component i followed the design uh, listed on balsamic so uh, everything is in the, like it's, it's uh, everything is uh, uh, and like every data point and everything is from the self service api uh, there is no dummy data or mock api involved so and uh, the next thing uh, which on which i worked was third party transfer component so third party transfer component has same ui as the transfer component is just that only the api calls differ and here is the third party transfer component so since there are no beneficiaries uh, no options are available uh, for the to field and for the from field uh, the user gets uh, options of uh, his uh, savings and loan accounts that are activated and uh, so and then uh, the next uh, component on which i worked was uh, beneficiary base uh, since there is no no beneficiary but the table is functional api calls are working uh, here are the api calls which are uh, being called to the uh, mobile instance of penrack and uh, so uh, these are all the components on which i work and uh, yeah uh, we uh, for the uh, future implementations uh, we have uh, loan application savings account application and beneficiaries applications uh, adding new beneficiaries still pending and uh, the next thing i would like to discuss is uh, what what i felt with the project like uh, uh, how how did i started it and how did i approach it and uh, what were my uh, personal review so first thing i would like to start was like uh, i believe that uh, setting the proper project structure uh, still uh, consumed a lot uh, a lot of the time uh, in the first one but uh, uh, i i personally believe and what uh, and also uh, my mentors review that uh, that a proper structure and proper pattern is uh, very much necessary for uh, uh, for the continued long life of the project and so that others can also get along with it and the second reason why i chose to follow the same project structure as web app was uh since uh, we have we already have uh, a lot of projects in our community like uh, a lot of uh, uh, tech umbrella projects so uh, what i thought is was that uh, if if we follow a specific same structure uh, so it will be better for the contributors and the new, new contributors uh, to get along with our projects uh, more quickly uh, they 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 like they they don't have to so go through uh, every uh, like the projects again and again to just understand what's going in structure wise and um, second thing was uh, there were two approaches which i could have taken uh, the first was uh, i could have built all the ui components and then i could have integrated the apis uh, but what i chose was the second one the second one was uh, i built the ui components and integrated the api simultaneously so that whatever work is done uh, is uh, uh, like that makes more sense because uh, if, if if a component is done it means that it's fully functional and uh, there is no need for uh, others to dig dig into it and then just uh, to make it work uh, so 
yeah uh, and uh, third thing what i felt was yeah the community helped me a lot like whenever we had any blockers uh, since uh, i started i did not have any uh, prior experience uh, with uh, uh, with with developing angular apps but yeah uh, my mentor and the whole community was uh, very helpful and uh, uh, and i believe uh, i i I pushed this project to uh, somewhat remarkable stage, and 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 I am still contributing to the project and uh, hoping to continue further and uh, be a contribute, uh, be a maintainer or 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 like just uh, uh, collaborate um, or or being a collaborator of the project uh, for a long period of time in the future. Um, that's all i would like to con uh, any uh, any questions before i conclude so thank you uh, manish for all the work this summer and we're looking forward to you continuing to wrap up the remaining features and then as we get our open banking apis published having the app consume the open banking apis so thank you again yeah. and thank you Ankit for your mentorship so, too. Yeah, thank you, Ed. Uh, thank you, Ankit, and uh, thank you to all the community members uh, for their uh, support and uh, help whenever I needed it. And uh, yeah, I am looking forward to continue with the project. And once the open banking APIs are published, uh, we can uh, do the mapping. And yeah. Okay. And then next thank up, you. thank you, Manish. Next up, Shashank. I think your audio is connected now, so we'll let you share your screen and we'll have you give your showcase. Yeah, uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, I just can't. Uh, is it visible now, uh, the screen? Yeah, it's visible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so hello everyone, uh, myself Shashank Priyadashi, and I'm currently in my second year, uh, currently studying in uh, BTEC uh, from the field Computer Science with a specialization in Artificial Intelligence. So, uh, yeah, throughout the summer, I worked on a project called Android Field Operation, basically like Android Client. So, uh, it is a project uh, based on the MyFOS X, uh, Fenrec 1.X. Uh, so, uh, this project basically uh, like is very helpful for the, the developer for the uh, field officer, so where he can keep uh, track the client's data, like uh, like their loans account, savings account, centers, groups, and uh, other uh, information related to clients, like rent reports and uh, collection sheets. So uh, uh, throughout this uh, three month long program, I worked on a few things. The first thing which I worked was the bottom navigation and the floating action button in dashboard. So uh, this, uh, okay, just one. Yeah. So yeah, this is the bottom navigation. So as the four frequent features of the applications are the uh, dashboard for the searching the clients and the, the, it, the clients list itself. And the, uh, the third one is the centers and the fourth one is the groups. So I added these four bottom navigation. So uh, yeah, as you, as you can see, the first one is the dashboard and then the uh, center, the client centers and et cetera. So this was, a, and also this is a bottom uh, float, uh, floating action button here, you can see. Like if the user clicks on, uh, if the user clicks on that button, so it will provide a four, uh, three buttons. Uh, the first one, uh, the first button is for the uh, creating new client. The second button is for the creating new centers. The third button is for the creating uh, new group. And so that like previously, the, uh, this was uh, like present in the overflow menu. So I just like changed it to a, a floating action button and also like added a logout button here to uh, like, uh, like uh, uh, accessing the logout feature from the uh, first page itself. So this was the first thing which I did. The second one was the adding the localization support that is a multi-language support. So previously uh, the application contains the translation up to uh, seven languages and also the one PR was sent for the eighth language. So uh, like, yeah, after, so we can say like there are eight languages but there's a no proper uh, like translation uh, features available. So I added a, a language change feature so that user can change to these eight languages. Uh, so that uh, it would be very helpful for the uh, users uh, which are like familiar with their own language like Spanish, Hindi, English and Chinese, etc. Uh, this was the second thing. The third thing which I did was the UI enhancement. So basically like the UI, uh, previously the UI was not that much good, like it was just developed. 
so i added a few uh, like i did a did a few more uh, ui development like the login changes changes uh, changed to this one like the one which is present in the mypost app and then the other pages are like the uh, the, uh, the dashboard which uh, pages changed uh, to this way similarly the other uh, like the, uh, the individual collection sheet and the client details are also changed this was the third thing which i did and the fourth thing was like the instant search feature and the search fragment so previously uh, what was uh, what was there like if you if you uh, like like write a, uh, write write the name of a client or external id then you need to press search button and then it will search but it is not a dynamic like you you will let's say you will delete something and then you need to again press search button then it will search so also so also added the search uh, feature uh, like instant search feature here the fifth thing was dark mode support so yeah dark as we all know like dark mode support is very helpful uh, uh, these days like it reduces the light emitted by devices also like reduces the eye strain and also like it optimizes the battery in in very much better way so now like the u app contains three uh, three options like the first one is light the second one is dark and the third one is system default so yeah you can see uh, it is present in the settings there so like it will show uh, uh, like it will provide the uh, it, like it will provide the options to change the mode and then the next thing was the main feature one of the features like the notification frame or uh, different notification framework so the first thing like which was mentioned was uh, like i did in path tracking so if you click on uh, creating a path so that it will show that the path tracking is turned on so for now uh, like there was no uh, like there was no support to the uh, path like it was not showing the tracked path so once it will show the tracked path like if it, if i find that dummy data so it will also show uh, show the client name like for for whom the recording is going to uh, going to happen and then the also the second thing was like offline mode if you like click on this offline button so it will show that the offline mode is turned on which is very like helpful because sometimes what happens like whenever the user is uh, is in like you know creating the known or or adding something so that it is uh, like if he need to go back again uh, and check that whether the offline mode is enabled or uh, not so it is the second, uh, the sixth thing and then the seventh thing was like change passport features so previously like uh, user don't have any feature like he, if he wants to reset the password then he need to like go back he need to again log out and then log in again and then change the password so for now it is present in the settings that like you can easily just go and uh, change the password from there the eighth thing was the about app so as, as application like every application needs to have about app uh, so this like previously it was missing, missing in the application so i added the about feature so now it like it shows a few things like the what is it, what actually the app does and the uh, like the few things like if you if you find any bugs so where to report and and the github and the contributors list uh, in the about us page the ninth thing was identifier status type so uh, it was a uh, not that much, uh, major thing but the thing is like if you create a new identifier so it has two options like whether the identifier is active or inactive so uh, like if it like previously what it does like if it, uh, it doesn't show any status type so you can't know that whether the Uh, identity like in this case aadhar card aadhar id is active or not active so added a new a new row so that it will show that whether it is active or inactive the tenth thing was kyc uh, client onboarding feature so now uh, like uh, there was no like uh, there was no any feature to just save that particular level for the api so i i just uh, like saw the documentation and discussed with my mentor like what should be the workflow so he suggested me to add the uh, level level type kyc so now what it does is like it uh, like as you see uh, like in the client detail there's a uh, in our pre button button there's a feature called client level so like when you first create a, any client so it will ask you some basic information like the uh, like the name middle name and the phone number uh, gender etc so you know, from that thing the level 1 is done and if you want to do level 2 kyc so it will just uh, like you can just select level 2 and it will ask for the second level uh, authentication like the documents so that from here you can upload the document and if you select the third level so it will ask you for the uploading the identifiers like what is what are the identifiers as i previously mentioned so this was the kyc feature so uh, yeah like if a part, like if a, like uh, if a particular api and everything is called so that you can store the dead documents for a, that user and it, it varies from user to user like you can change uh, you can add delete or uh, like you can uh, update and delete the document and identifiers too and the 11th feature uh, 11th thing was like extending support of kotlin so previously like this application was converted like completed uh, completely uh, in java so I, i like as this application contains like two parts the offline part and the online part so like major major ports were in the online part so i converted the whole online ports into the 
uh, Kotlin language, like creating a new client uh, for, uh, course related to groups, code related, course related to surveys, centers, and other types of code which are in the present in the online world. So all these codes are converted into Kotlin now. Uh, and then the future improvements for the application, uh, this application is like the first thing is SMS push notification. So like as mentioned, uh, it, it should have three type of uh, push notifications. The first one is triggered, and then should build and die. So as like uh, like with, uh, the currently there's no SCM integration in the one point uh, uh, fenric. So uh, now like I just uh, like I didn't uh, uh, like added this thing in the application. So I I think that if if SCM is integrated in the one fenric one point x, so we can like add this uh, add this feature easily in the application. And the second thing was the GIS support. So uh, GIS sub and GIS support like currently it contains the part tracker and the pinpoint. So I like sent a PR related to uh, GIS thing. So like if you uh, create a new client and if you record a new location, so it will show that the map view. And if you click on that map view, it will show the all the nearby users, like all all other users which are there. So for now, I use the dummy data. So uh, like if you if you create on a particular map, so it will show uh, like if a client visits on that particular area, so it will show all the other clients which are present nearby, so that he can easily uh, like uh, do whatever like, he wants to do with the uh, with the other users. So yeah, this was the work uh, which I did uh, throughout the uh, resource, and I was expecting to work more with the application by integrating the SMS push notification, GIS support, and also try to convert a few like whole application into Kotlin. So yeah, uh, thank you to the community for giving me uh, this wonderful opportunity, so that like I worked uh, with the uh, organization and like. I got to know like, how the organization and the community works. So yeah, thank you everyone. Uh, uh, do you have any questions? Are there any questions for Shashank? If there are, feel free to type them in either the Q&A or the chat. Right. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, did you explore uh, whether the FINRAC uh, notifications uh, there is a Firebase cloud messaging implementation there, uh, but we are not sure uh, if it works or not. Have you tried invoking the yeah, APIs? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I work with the both uh, like two things. The first one is SMS campaign APIs, and then another one is the FCMs. But yeah, it 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 was not any integrated. So like we like the other people also like the other interns uh, like the Devansh and Shange, so like they also didn't work with the uh, like. They told like it, it was not working with Fenelect one context. So I also tried integrating it with FCM, but it, it doesn't it didn't work. Oh, oh thank you. Great work. Uh, thank you. And also like I updated the readme, like it was updated long back. So now, now the new readme is like this. Uh, yeah, so so like yeah, it contains the basic information about and all the features and shots and how to contribute development setup. Building the code and the Travis CI, like, uh, let it contain the checklist style, PMD, and find works. So, yeah, everything is updated here now. Any other question? No, well, thank you again, Shashank, for all that work. And hopefully, we can, you know, get those blockers out of the way and look forward to having you continue efforts on this and also, you know, take the lead in helping to maintain the application going forward and thank you to you know abilash for mentoring you throughout the summer and to run for helping kick off the process as well but we're hoping to get the work that you've worked on released very soon so stay forward and look forward to that community that will have the next version of our android client out soon yeah yeah, yeah sure i will i love contributing more on the application and like for the community Thank you. Okay, and then Ashwin. Uh, yeah, I hope I'm audible. Uh, uh, can you people hear me? Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. So let me just share my screen. Yeah, so is my screen as well? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I can't hear you all. Yeah, go right ahead and continue, Ashwin. Sorry, my audio is not working. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the confirmation. Yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm Ashwin and I'm a sophomore pursuing computer science and engineering. And I would be showcasing the work that I've done throughout the past summer as part of the SOC. So, uh, yeah, most of my work was focused on converting Mifo's mobile uh, customer facing self service app on top of Rack, which had 88% uh, of Java and I managed it managed to convert it to 100% just Kotlin. And I also made a basic architecture for uh, me for mobile to help develop the app uh, in Kotlin multi-platform so as uh, to compile logic for both Android and iOS. And I also documented the work in a POC wiki page for starter developers to have a quick understanding of how Kotlin multi-platform works and how we can proceed with adding it to our app. And uh, I also worked on writing UI tests for the app so that the developer won't have to manually test the app for any exceptions that can break the app's basic functionality while developing the app. And uh, I also combined all these self service APIs consumed by Mifos Mobile uh, in a sheet. So, yeah, I'll just go quickly go through why it was decided to convert the app to Kotlin. So Kotlin is a new language that has adapted and corrected its mistake over time. So like it is a very concise language and uh, we all uh, uh, will obviously notice it once we start using it. And for the same fact, in hindsight, Android apps written in Java may cease to exist. So we can ensure that the app will be unlikely to become obsolete in terms of development. And uh, well known as the billion dollar mistake of Java, the null pointer exceptions are less likely to appear in a Kotlin app as the null type was integrated into the type system. So uh, it's not needed to keep wrapping codes with null checks so we can avoid NPEs. And uh, the main point of interest for us in converting the app to Kotlin is the fact that we would be able to compile the business logic of the app to both Android and iOS at the same time by making use of Kotlin multi-platform. And I, uh, so there isn't much I can talk about uh, this conversion work in the showcase as it has little to no effect on how the app works, but there were quite a few bug fixes uh, which was made along with the conversion, like the new authentication method. And uh, as you can see, the app was now fully in Kotlin. Uh, and it, uh, allows us to reap all the benefits as mentioned earlier. And there was approximately 23% decrease in the number of lines of code uh, post conversion. And uh, that is the average number of lines uh, that is uh, that can be reduced uh, when uh, an, uh, any Android app that is written in Java is uh, converted to Kotlin. And uh, we managed to reach that number. And there is still a lot more scope for reducing the size of the code base for the more. Like how uh, we can use Kotlin's features like using uh, data classes to express plain old Java objects in a much simpler way and uh, lambda functions to shorten a few functions and uh, we can also use the Android extension functions like the set on click listener instead of using button knives annotations and bindings. And I also extensively tested the app manually by myself and compared it to that of the Java version and there were no bugs due to the conversion to the best of my knowledge. And uh, next, uh, this is the architecture I've implemented for multi-platform in my first mobile. So as you may know, the Android module already exists. And uh, the iOS part is a new iOS project out of Xcode. And uh, though on a top level, it is two different projects. They may make use of the same native code that is generated by Kotlin multi-platform using the source code present uh, here in the common shell you know, the common chat code module. And uh, the Kotlin native code will be generated when we execute this command uh, or uh, use our Gradle build in Android Studio with this specification, and uh, which in turn can be imported both into Swift and Kotlin in uh, Android and iOS. And uh, in turn, the shared module has three sub-modules, one for Android specific code, uh, one for Android specific, and one for iOS and then the common one and I'll explain them in the next slide. 
Yeah, so as a sample, I've only demonstrated how to share a string between both uh, the iOS and Android. So I also explained how to use platform specific functions using the expect and actual methods. So these screens in Android and iOS, I have explained them in the POC wiki page, which I wrote uh, with better detail. And in here, I uh, the, the first part of these strings displayed in the both devices are the same. So we see my first mobile is now running on. Uh, and here, and here there's a toast which says uh, my first mobile is running on Android. So this is the common part of the code which will be present in this common main directory. And uh, the platform specific uh, part, which is the iOS and Android, it will be mentioned in their actual uh, sources, which will be here in Android specific and iOS specific uh, directories. And this is the wiki page in my repository for a Kotlin multi-platform version of me first mobile. So about two weeks ago when I implemented this, uh, Kotlin multi-platform was in uh, beta and they had only one tutorial and no proper documentation. But uh, around a week back, uh, JetBrains has rolled out Kotlin multi-platform mobile in alpha and it has a proper documentation now and they also brought a lot uh, more ID integration in Android Studio 4.1. So most of what I did is made easier in the ID integration and the easiest steps are available in their docs. So this is a new documentation and uh, they also now have a separate page for integrating KMO into an existing app. So that is what we are interested in and I have also linked it in the wiki page. So next I will talk about the UI tests. And so uh, Espresso is a testing framework which I've used then that comes under the Android Jetpack test library. So it provides APIs for writing UI tests so as to simulate the interactions that a user will make and also assert checks so uh, we can make sure that the app behaves as expected. So the purpose of UI testing is that it helps to ensure that users won't encounter an unexpected results or have a poor experience when interacting with the app. So it also helps us develop uh, as developers ensure that we do not break any part of the app on course of development. And uh, this is the simulation for login test. Let me just, I hope it's visible. So as you can see, there is no input from the user. All of this is automated. So this will uh, check the complete flow for login. And this one is the test I wrote for checking the clickable buttons in the home screen. So this is automated as well. Yeah, so likewise we will be able to cover all the flows in the app. And I'm also working on mocking the network layer inside uh, UI testing to uh, you know, like uh, logging in and fetching information uh, takes some time and uh, it, it might uh, as well fail uh, if the server is down and uh, we can save a lo lot more time. Uh, and I'm also still working on it and I'm hoping to get that done sooner and I'll add more test cases. Uh, and I missed to add the AP matrix in the slides, but it is present in my work report just where you can have a look at it. So. That is all about it from me for the past summer. And I would also love to take this opportunity to thank all the people who have helped me work and make progress in this project. My primary mentor, Sakshin, for keeping track of my progress and guiding me throughout the coding period amidst this hectic schedule. And big thanks to Ed for helping me and all of the interns get their blockers resolved and mediating between all of us. And overall, it was a great experience for me working with me first, and I would also continue my, maintaining my work on this project in the future and uh, would be too happy to help any contributor to work on me first mobile. So yeah, thank you all and open to questions if any. Yeah, you can also feel free to write to me in my mail or Slack. Thank you, Ashwin. If there are any questions, feel free to post them in the chat or in the Q&A. But looking forward to having you continue all the great work that you've accomplished already, Ashwin. Hopefully, we can you know get the changes that Shivangi made and others on their customer-facing apps merged onto your 
code base and then also you know have you help with some of the open banking efforts as well i'm glad you were able to focus on the espresso ui test too so great to see how much you accomplished thank you that's auction for all your mentorship Ashwin. thanks a lot okay uh next up uh, shubham we're gonna have you showcase your efforts and i think you might be one of the attendees listed as avik but i'll let you begin sharing your screen. Then Avik, uh, maybe I was wrong, but is one of, okay, I think. Do you know if Shivam is logged in right now? Um, I can call him. Okay, uh, yeah, let me think him. I, I assume he might have been one of the double eyes. <laughs> Possible, yeah. Let's yeah, see. but one, one moment and then uh, Mehul, we'll let Mehul showcase yeah. now. So Mehul, if you want to begin sharing your screen. Yeah, sure. Am I audible? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. I'll share my screen. Yeah, so is my screen visible? Yes, your screen's visible. Great. So in this summer, I worked on a credit scoring app uh, powered by machine learning. So what this app does is actually like providing the power of machine learning to predict whether a loan applicant should be provided a loan or it should be denied. So we, when we were planning this project, we tried to keep the technical involvement of the user minimal. So that is why we like, we try to give all the features in it from classical AI to the deep learning that is currently very popular. So we have tried to provide the rule base and the uh, uh, machine learning methods, statistical methods and everything in it with just a minimal knowledge of everything. So we can start here, like I'll show you a demo. We, we can create features. Uh, the features are something, uh, you can example, for example, we can take this age. If we are giving a loan, we might be taking uh, in age of a person that given some weightage or not. So here we will be defining age here. Uh, for example, I'll show you. Uh, I have defined here. This second I'll give an example. Yeah. So H, as we can see here, H we have given in and we will be giving in a value type and a data type. So we are providing all these because each of the data has to process differently. So that is why we will be giving in all these details here. Now, when we go to the next screen, we are going to provide a configuration here. So what configuration means is, for example, we have around 10 to 12 features. So each feature must be given a weightage that how much age or how much salary weighs in giving in loan. So how much it should be weighed. So here we'll be providing a weightage and we are giving three colors as an output. Uh, for example, the red color means we won't be giving out loan. Amber means that we are still dicey. We can give him or we can deny it. And green means that he's clear to give out loan. Uh, I can show you an example of a feature configuration here. Uh, we can do the same. So here I have given a weightage of 0 0.5. The weightage would be between zero to one. And the score range where uh, we have given here is actually a score calculated using the weightage of this screen and score we would be giving in next screen. I'll be showing you just now. Uh, now we start here with creating a criteria. So criteria is something, uh, let us take an example here. For example, age we take. So we are giving a score of, I would say uh, six, five, 10, anything to a particular age range, for example, uh, a person from 25 to 45 has more ability to pro uh, give back the loan amount. So we will giving him more score here. Yeah, I'll just show you an example. Uh, yeah, so like I have given three criteria I have made, these are just demo. Uh, for example, an 18 to 25 would be given a score of four. A uh, 25 to 45 would be given a score of eight and 40 to 75 given a score of two. All these scores would be multiplied with the weightage uh, that has been said before, and then it would be showing out a final score, which will be used to tell whether the person should be given out the loan or it should be or he should be denied the loan. 
so now there can be possibility that some of the features for example civil score is coming from another api or something so here we have provided around three possibilities from where we can calculate the data or sorry where we can fetch the data one is xml one is json and other sql so for sql we will write the query here for json we will write the link and the key here and for xml same thing uh, we have like we still have to manage the protection guards here for example uh, we can't uh, download the civil score of anyone we need to know his credentials for that we still have to apply that cover here and then we will be able to get the uh, like any of the features from the internet or apis who requires credentials now at the end we will create a scorecard for example i give a loan id of 3 now i am giving all the three methods now all these the all the features that are still explained uh, were for rule based for statistical we went through various of the research papers and found out few methods that would be good to provide a better statistical modeling for credit scoring and we came out with linear regression polynomial regression and manova at the moment and we are still processing value at return so these were some of them so we when we press the statistical one we go through like we have the option we can select any of them and we have then provided a machine learning method so in machine learning method we have all types of machine learning methods uh, for example probabilistic one statistical one even the deep uh, neural network ones so what it does is once we have like set in the data uh, it would actually calculate the best f1 score or best accuracy and then it would give out the best prediction out of them now we have also provided a link here what does this column do? what does this field does uh, for example we have our data stored somewhere or we want the we want to test the model on some data we can actually provide the data here uh, the link here and then we can upload the data and the model would be running on that data i'll give an example of uploading which is yeah so here you can see that overall score there and overall color here now when we can check the statistical one it is showing green that we can provide the loans an accuracy of 70% similarly for machine learning it is zero that we can provide it with an accuracy of 73% so this is currently what i have done in this and we are looking forward to integrate an api uh we have still have to decide which one it is but yeah uh, this most of sums up all my work yeah uh, and any questions now, thank you for showcasing all that it's very exciting to now have these capabilities within uh Polarac and the community app and the and then lalit was there anything you would like to add in addition to what mehul just showcase Hello. oh just one moment lala i have to make you a panelist if you wanted to speak so okay so if you had anything additional to add about all the work that mehul did feel free to come off mute lalit so. sorry um i'm back and yeah this is certainly a good job done by mehul i know it's only a beginning uh, we want to add a uh, lot of more features we want to standardize platforms i know the community is working on various initiatives leveraging machine learning uh, this is one of them we want to see how we can build some uh, platform that uh, on which various use cases can be developed with very minimal uh, developer involvement thank you lalit and then thank you again mehul and looking forward to the continue evolution of these features and eager to get this incorporated into the forthcoming finrac release so thank you thank again you, thank you everyone yeah it was a great time working with you and i'll i like i look forward to working with you again i'll try to like get in touch more and more in it thank you mehul thank you. okay and then next up we're going to have shubham and he's going to demonstrate the gsma mobile money api connector he built on top of the payment hub 
along with the mentorship of Avik. So Shubham, whenever you're ready, I'll let you begin sharing your screen and showcasing your great efforts thus far. Uh, hi, everyone. Oh, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'll let you start sharing my screen. Is my screen mm -hmm. visible? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, hi everyone, I'm Shubham. I am a recent graduate. Uh, recent graduate. I, I graduated last month. So, uh, I I worked on the GSM mobile money API connector on top of the payment of enterprise edition that we were working on. So, uh, before I start, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, GSMA uh, API spec in general. So, so uh, GSMA API specification helps in helps us standardizing the mobile money APIs. So, currently there are a lot of mobile money providers. So, it would be very helpful if if there is a standard API specification which is being followed by everyone. It would uh, help in integrating the mobile money services by by various various third parties. So the uh, so the GSMA API spec. Uh, provides exactly that. We we also have the uh, website over here. Uh, so over here we could we could pretty much see the all the objects and and how the how the uh, APIs work, etc. And 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 it's, it's very extensive. Like uh, some people have uh, have really covered everything that is there to be covered in these cases. So. Uh, this is from the point of uh, integration. It it obviously eases out the uh, is out the integration for the various third parties, and and then there is also an adaptation part of things, which I'll be talking a little bit later uh, on the demo. So uh, so I started with uh, with account management APIs. So so the account management APIs uh, has has various uh uses so some of them are account status if we if you if you want to know what is the status of an account uh, so we can use the account status and then we can we have the account balance and then we have the account holder name and and there are a few other account uh, uh, management APIs as well such that uh, such as account statements and then account transaction it shows uh, all, all the transactions inside uh a, a, a particular savings account. So uh, I'll show a quick, quick demo of the APIs that are present. So I'll just quickly show the speakers. Right. So so over here we have to pass the MSI SDN. MSI SDN is basically an account identifier type, and then we have to pass the account identify itself so once you pass them and then we uh, have a have a pet request and it will show that the account status is available if it was some other uh, account for us say it would say that uh, identification error account does not exist <clears throat> so so we similarly we have balance Because the balance we see, there's there's current balance, available balance, is out balance, the the currency, everything, and then we have uh, our name. With the name we see that it 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 shows a pretty uh, broken name status. So we have to title, first name, middle name, last name, and the full name. So, so moving on from the account management APIs, we are going to uh, come into the peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So, so the peer-to-peer -peer transaction is a is a, a payer-initiated transaction. Uh, I'm not sure if okay, it, this might not be visible, so I'll just show in this APM model itself. So, so this is the payment flow which takes place in case of a P2P transfer. So, in the first block, we have the uh, RTID lookup and the and the account validation. So in this case, what happens is uh, the the payer is is getting validated on the interact side if the 
if 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 the payer exists and if the payer has has sufficient permissions and account balance to, to actually proceed with the payment. So in the first case, we have the payer uh, account lookup and the account validation, and then we move to the the e side of things. So so we need to also check if the payee is present on the mobile money platform. Uh, so to check check that. Uh, we have a worker for the payee account status. Uh, this is a callback which has been implemented. So if 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 there is a, a failure, like if the if, if somehow the response doesn't reach us, uh, we have a retry method, which sort of uh, calls it multiple times and then gets the response. Uh, then we move on to blocking of funds. So, so once we sort of uh, confirm that the uh, okay, so the payer exists, the payee exists, everything is good, then we proceed to the blocking of funds. So, in this case, the the payer's uh, account uh, gets uh, some of the funds blocked for the transaction. So, once the uh, funds have been blocked, then we move on to the uh, sending the transfer request. So, so in this transfer request, we call the or GSMA APIs or or the mobile money APIs uh, to to actually initiate the transfer. So in this case, it is a there is a callback implemented over here. So whenever the uh, payment is successful, the the callback gets a, a request response body, and then it it proceeds to the payment. So sometimes what happens, it might be possible that the uh, Callback shows that the transaction has failed due to some reason. In that case, it would follow this path on top over here, and it it would go over there. And now there is also the case that uh, transaction might have completed, might not have completed, but somehow the callback did not reach us. It might be because of a network error or some kind of an error. In that case, we we have a transaction management system which is uh, which basically calls the transaction state of that API of the uh, transfer. So, so in that transaction state worker, we are going to call the GSMA API using the transaction ID, and and, and we're going to manually verify if if the uh, transaction has completed or not. So, if the transaction complete, it again comes on over here, and it says that. Uh, Say so the transaction is completed, and then it moves on ahead. So let's say the transaction has failed due to some reason. So in that case, it follows the path above over here. So in this case, the 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 amount that has been blocked initially gets released on the payer side, and then it moves on to uh, send the channel that the payment has failed. In case, and and most of the time in the payment uh, completes successfully. In that case, we have to book the amount on the payer side, saying that, okay, so the transaction is completed, now we're going to book the amount. So, so the amount gets booked, and then it gets sent to the channel as a, as a, as a confirmation that, okay, so the transaction is completed. So, so this was uh, P2P, peer-to-peer -peer transfer. Uh, moving on. Okay, moving on. So merchant payment. So merchant payment is basically a PE initiated transfer. So in this case, what would happen is uh, instead of instead of uh, uh, payer lookup over here and the PE lookup over here, it would be opposite. So, so the PE gets looked up first on the FinRAC side. So if the if the PE exists and the and the account is completely valid or not, and then on the on the while money side, the, uh, the 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 payer is 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 validated. When the payer is 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 completely valid, the again the same same scenario takes place. But over here, in case of the in case of the payer blocking the fund, it would be the payees, and it would follow the similar path. Uh, inside on the on on the code level, there is one single flag which is called RTP request to pay. So request to pay sort of uh, makes it possible to switch between uh, uh, pay initiated and payer initiated without actually uh, making a completely different flow altogether. 
uh, right. Uh, then we move on to transaction management. So, so like in the in the BDM when I spoke about uh, getting the transaction state. So transaction state is basically to to cover the fail safe option. So if in this in case there is some callback error, some kind of an error, and 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 we don't know what's happening. In this cases, the hitting the transaction state, hitting the transaction response are the users of this uh, transaction management APIs or the or the task workers. Uh, okay, then we have link based payment. So so in case of GSMA introduced the sort of a link based payment. So what essentially link based payment does is so in case let's say someone wants to move money from their uh, savings account to mobile money on it. So in this case, a link is created between the savings account and the mobile money wallet, and then that link is used to to transfer the money. So over here, we again start with the similar setup. First, the first the payer is getting validated, and the payee. So in this case, the payer is basically the the savings account, and then payee is the is the mobile money wallet wallet and then so so this gets validated and then uh, so over here this part is, is, is a little different so over here we are we are creating a link so so the link gets created between well the savings account and and the mobile money wallet so every link has a has has a link reference created so 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 that link reference gets used in the in this send transfer request over here so, so using that that link ref reference, it sort of replaces the MSI SDNs and the and the identifier types. That that single link reference gets used to to facilitate the transaction. It is similar. Um, it's pretty much same as the uh, previous one. Uh, after that point, only only this part is sort of new over here. Uh, so, so, so also one thing to mention over here is that GSMS simulator wasn't really working to um, make the link best payment removable so, so so I can't really show it uh, right now that uh, if it's completely working or not because the uh, TSMA simulator has been under uh, maintenance or under, under work for 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 last one month or so. Uh, okay authorization codes so authorization codes are uh, so, so in case of a merchant payment or or, or, or let's say a pay initiated payment, so a payer can pass an authorization code in the transaction request to as sort of a sort of a pre-approval. So in this case, what happens? The payee is going to uh, so so it's more like the uh, payer sub gives an authorization code to the payee, and then the and then the payee is like, okay, so, so I'm going to use this authorization code to request money from the payer. So for this one uh, feature that was added in this same pull request, and then there is transaction reversal. So uh, so in, so transaction reversal over here is um, similar to uh, reverse or so, uh, refund a transaction. In this case, we just pass the transaction ID in the in the API, and then the transaction is reversed on the top. Okay, moving on to bill payment, uh, bills management, and, and the bill payment. So uh, on the on the note of bill management, we have a few things. So first of all, we we, we have the APIs to get associated bills for an identifier. So um, so it might be possible that a single identifier might have already registered to some of the uh, billing companies, and then the company sent the bills to them. And and we also have the APIs to to, to get the associated bill companies for the identifier. Uh, then we okay. Now we're moving on to the payment side of things. So uh, I'll show the BPMN and explain this. So this is the bill payment uh, BPMN. So over here again the the Payer is is completely validated if the payer exists on the FinTrack side. If it has um, sufficient balance and, and is available, then we move to build build validation. So so every 
transaction call to the channel is going to consist of a billing reference or a or a billing ID. So using that billing reference, we have, we are going to uh, sort of verify if the if the bill actually exists and then hasn't been paid before. So once it is completely uh, uh, validated, we are going to move on to the next part, which is with blocking the fund. So again, on the payer side, the funds are blocked and then we move to bill payment. So in this case, we are sending a, a bill payment request to the GSMA uh, APIs and and we, and we wait for the transaction to, to take place. Again, again, there's a callback implemented so that the callback can, uh, uh, so once the payment is successful, the callback gets set. Okay, so if it is somehow it gets lost again, the transition state is used. And then uh, if successful, uh, funds are booked. If not, funds are released. Uh, okay, uh, international remittance. So, so on the international remittance side, there were a few new things added to the existing peer-to-peer -peer or the or the peer-initiated payment. So, so, if we come to uh, international remittance, so again it starts with the uh, uh, validation and the and the verification then we move on to the to the uh, payer code so so the payer uh, has to uh, has a has a quotation aspect to it so in case the payer uh, will have some kind of a fees to actually proceed with the transaction so in this case the payer code first takes place and then we pass the uh, transaction to to the payee process. So, so uh, now once so, so so this worker starts this payee process. Uh, so on the payee process, we we again have a, a local code. So in this case, the local code is on the payee side of things. And uh, so once once we have the payee code, and then it so moves on to the connect uh, moves on towards transaction. Now both both of the trans both of the flows are happening at the same time, I would say. So once once the the payee side gets started, we, we block the funds on on the on the payer side and then we move on to sending the transaction request and then again waiting for it to complete. So once the transaction is completed over here on the payer side, the payee side gets the gets the transfer event. So now the now the payee also books the fund to to, to his ledger in a sort. So the uh, so, so now the amount gets booked on the payer side as well as on the payee side, and then it again moves on towards the uh, towards the confirmation. Or if it fails, it goes to Lubbock, did Subha mean to go off, go on mute? Uh, I think uh, his internet dropped because okay. I cannot pick him. Yeah, I don't think he's in the meeting. Okay, well, while we, while we wait for Shubham to come back, uh, feel free to add anything, Avik, about what he's worked on so far. Right. So on the pay side or GSMA adoption side, uh, we took the largest, uh, the GSMA international remittance use case and uh, focused on the pay side, how we can adopt the GSMA APIs inside the payment of channel connector. Uh, yep. Hi. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm audible. Yeah, we can hear you. Shubham. Yeah, sorry. Uh, somehow my Chrome browser stopped working. One second. Uh, is my screen visible? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So so now uh, this is on the uh, uh, payer and the and the payee deposit situation. So let's say the uh, we're sort of using the payer flow, the the P2P flow over here. 
So instead of calling the GSMA simulator, in this case, what we're doing is we're going to call the PE channel uh, API. So we're going to call the, call the PE channel API and then we're going to start the start the PE flow. So in this way, what happens the the, the PE books the amount on the on the ledger and then it uh, gives sense to pay failure if the failure goes to channel or if the success goes to channel so once this pay side of things take place we then send it uh, back to over here so so over here the uh, transfer response is a call back again it, it it receives okay so the pay has completed the transaction everything was all good and then we move to uh, book the amount or if it fails they can finish the amount so in this case if you are going to towards the uh, pay side of things pay deposit in this case we we won't be calling the gsms simulator instead we're going to call the uh, call the pay ch channel api okay uh, okay i'll show a quick demo of of what i uh, just showed over here uh, one second uh, one second, I'll just forward the ports. So, so this is the command to operate. Uh, of the control which, which takes place uh, which is used to monitor all the all the instances of the day let's say so currently there are no instances uh, running over here so i'm going to call the api and see and so so this is the channel connector over here so uh these are the msi stains that we provide on the a debit party, a credit party, and then the currency as well. Currency amount. So let's give 99. And uh, uh, we can also provide the requesting layers and the, and the receiving layers. So essentially, the requesting layers and the receiving layers are actually used to to identify uh, identify which which payment hub or the or the vendor tenant to be called in this case. So we're going to send the transaction. Okay, so we got the transaction ID over here. Now let's refresh this once. So we see we have a payer process running over here. And if we check, okay, now we see that the payer process is stopped over here. So so in this case, let's say we can assume that the callback isn't working. So because the callback isn't working, it has stopped over here. After a minute, it's going to uh, take the above route and it's going to take get the uh, transaction state and continue with the with the flow. Uh, maybe I can show the payer payee side as well. Just a second. Mm. Okay, yeah, so mm, so we did a, did a lot of testing as you can see. Okay, so okay, so so this is the PE uh, process you can see. So we can see the amount 99 over here, which we took place, which we sent over there, and we can see that the PE process worked out just fine. If we go back and see, okay, now we see that the payer process also completed, but uh, let's just check it once. Uh, okay, so I think I lost it, but uh, you can reverse order by start time in in page one. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I I got it. So over here we can see that the uh, 
response sort of it 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 waited for complete one minute. So after after it waited for the one minute and then it sort of saw that okay, so the callback is incoming. Then it went to get the transaction state, and it saw okay, so transaction the it the transaction completed. Then it again submitted it over here. The transaction completed and and then the uh, remaining of the flow took place. Uh, so, so this was one of the uh, transition demo. Um, okay, so a few of the additional things that that are mentioned over here explicitly, I would say. So one of the things things is that the channel connector uh, uh, had to be enhanced a lot. So, so we uh, I, I had to add a lot of APIs, a lot of new new routes and stuff on the uh, on the channel connector to actually make make the payments take place. Then also, also on the uh, AMS connector side, I also had to uh, uh, modify the code a little bit, and then also had to uh, introduce a lot of new new task and workers to actually uh, make few of the transition take place. Uh, and also, uh, one thing to note here would be that uh, when I started the project, uh, payment of EE didn't really have any 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 documentation, so so I was pretty lost on the front when I started on how to how to actually set up the uh, uh, local environment and how I should proceed with the uh, with, with the development. But now, obviously, it got uh, extremely uh, extremely better. Uh, so because we we have the access to the app environment and also a big uh, deployed the environment on his. IBM Cloud, and uh, also I was for the past uh, week or two I was working on the on the on the KYC feature for the FinRAC. Uh, I was able to complete it, but I uh, but my uh, MySQL container uh, had to restart, so I can't really show it right now. Uh, and then I also worked on the uh, disbursement of loan. So instead of uh, actually uh, like hooking the amount to the pay, we can we can now sort of disperse the amount as a as a as a loan. So so I was I, I was uh, working on that. Uh, that part it hasn't been hasn't been completed. I'm still still working on that. So on the future front, uh, I would say that uh, a lot of things can be done, uh, such as the loan uh, disbursement, and then we can also uh, also figure out how. How there can be a sort of unified uh, testing model on on how how the code can be can be tested um, on that front uh, and yeah uh, that's that's pretty much all the work I did yep and also to thank um, thank Abik and and Panod specifically for uh, helping me out with, with everything it was uh, uh, during the start it was uh, extremely difficult to get started with this, but uh, Abhik and Manoj really helped me out throughout the uh, journey. Well, thank you, Shivam, for tackling this very complex and much needed project and looking forward to, you know, before you start your new full-time job, trying to wrap up some of the remaining uh, use cases we had discussed, but very happy that you've been able to complete so much and make so much progress on this project that's been a long time coming. And thank you, Abhik, for all your leadership and guidance for Shubham. Were there any questions from our audience to Shubham? And then Avik or Lalit or any of the mentors that were on today's call, did you have anything else to add? Yeah, so from the the pay side, which Shivam showed was referring to uh, adopting the GSMA spec. So there is some work there as well as uh, on the interoperation side, uh, Shivam had announced the KYC part. So those are some of the things which is outside the GSMA connector. Okay, thanks for adding those additional details, Avik. Hopefully we can try to wrap some of that up and then hopefully others in the community will then be able to 
take this reference implementation and follow the patterns there for implementing live mobile money APIs that are available in respective countries. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I think we ended right on time, right on schedule. So please try to attend our next showcase on this Thursday, and then we'll have links to all the recordings out available soon and our official wrap-up blog post, too. But thank you again, everyone. Take care and have a good evening, afternoon, or morning, wherever you might be. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Cheers.